You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's face it. It was you, Charlie. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to The Cinephiles, where this week we continue our exploration of Ilya Kazan's On the Waterfront. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. And I am John Roca. I'm a longshoreman uh, working down on the docks for Johnny Friendly. No, uh, I'm a voiceover artist, writer, producer, and host over at Collider, and of course, the Top Ten Show, uh, and Geek Buddies, and of course, this lovely show, and The Deep Cut. So and The Deep go. Cut. Let's get into it. Um, so where we left off, uh, that... Uh, after an amazing sort of long day with Edie, yeah. Terry Malloy, who had been avoiding seeing Johnny Friendly, finally got pulled over, and boy, they put the pressure on him. He's going back in the hold to do hard work because yep. he hasn't pleased Johnny Friendly. And it made it very clear that Johnny Friendly was not cool with K.O. Dugan, who is turning state's evidence. Right. Um, he's, mad, he's mad at Terry, that Terry was in that church and said nothing was going on, and homie is talking like crazy to the cops now, and uh, you get a sense of dread at this moment. Well, and this is the thing. Like one of the, one of the themes that's really starting to hit now is mm. loyalty. Yeah, is that from Johnny Friendly's perspective, and really from Terry's brother Charlie's perspective. Johnny Friendly has been taking care of Terry Malloy. Yeah. They've been giving him the cushy jobs. They've been helping him out. He's been probably working what he hasn't had to struggle the way that some of the other longshoremen have struggled. Right. And that's all because of the friendship and the care and the mentorship of this good guy named Johnny Friendly. At least that's how they see it. Yeah. And Terry's starting to see it a different way. Mm hmm. Uh, and we're, we're down in the hole working on a, a job and unloading what looks like some good Irish whiskey. Yeah. And uh, Dugan is there. And they start lifting up this big pallet of booze in the in the net, you know, being lifted up out of the hole by a crane. And we see that Dugan might have pilfered uh, a single <laughs> bottle, and he's making a joke. Yeah. And it's a beautiful shot, by the way, that oh, big yeah. pallet going up. And we see some of the tough guys there, and we see some looks exchanged. And we see the guy operating that crane do something, and that pallet falls breaks and it lands right on top of Dugan. Yeah. Someone calls for a doctor and someone else says he don't need a doctor. He needs a priest. He needs a priest. That happened pretty fast. Yeah. And right in front of Terry, who's down there in the yep. pits. And I wonder if this was a message not just to Dugan, not I just to everybody 100 else, percent think that. But also to Terry. Well, yeah. because they told him. Yep. Well, and this is, you know, and this is the thing we talked in our last episode about how much did Terry really know about what they were going to do to Joey Doyle? Right. And whether and and in my mind like he kind of maybe had to know deep down but he had denied it and maybe and maybe he just didn't know but right. now last night Johnny said we have the best muscle on the docks we're going to use it. Yeah. And today he Kim, used it. Dugan's dead. Yeah, Dugan's dead. You know, dead. there's no doubt about what's going on. And, and and this is the thing. I don't know how to how to put it in the right way but there are a lot of situations that we might see in the world today that are about loyalty, yeah, and about when do you when do you stand up against something you see going on that's wrong? Well, in all our areas of our life, we see that, right? Because some some bosses or yep. owners or whatever or people who run things they are very big about loyalty, and when your paycheck depends on you showing loyalty. Yep. It's very hard to when you've got a wife or kids or a mortgage or or cars or whatever. Yeah. It's very hard to be like, oh no, I'm going to stand up against this situation, yeah. and risk everything. And I will even here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to not mention the major thing in our world that this might relate to, right. and instead say that just uh, yesterday the CEO of McDonald's was forced to step down because of an affair. Right. A week ago or two weeks ago, the Ronan Farrow book came out yeah. that was all about the pressure to uh, protect Matt Lauer. Mm -hmm. And that and the, and again, this is the same thing. Are people going to speak out about things that everybody knew was going on? Right. Or are they going to shut the hell up? Boeing was in front of Congress yep. testifying about who knew about these problems with the 737 MAX jet. This is what's just happened in the last two or three weeks. And yeah. again, it's the same thing. People at Boeing saying hey i wouldn't fly on this plane myself 
that you put too much pressure on the safety people. This plane is not safe. And Boeing did not respond, and they put down that information. Yeah. So just in the last month, here are four examples of, of situations where there were things going on, and people were faced with the choice of do they stay stand up and say what's going on or do they not stand up and 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 a and an institution that has a uh a fiduciary uh motivation to keep the information down right you know mm -hmm. and i didn't even mention the big one you mean whistleblowers <laughs> well, that's what i mean honestly we gotta talk, we're gonna have to talk about whistleblowers i oh, don't want to yeah. make this thing i i i i, I I, and I think there's a way to talk about this. Yeah. I mean, obviously, everyone who listens to this show knows that you and I have a particular political point of view. Sure. But I think there's a way to talk about the idea of a whistleblower without actually making it about politics. Well, but we'll see. There have been many whistleblowers of the history of time that don't right. have to do with politics. Yeah. So, yeah. I came down here to keep a promise. I gave K.O. my word that if he stood up to the mob, I'd stand up with him. All the way. And now K.O. Dugan is dead. Carl Malden. Yeah. This scene with him, this is where you see the power of this actor. Mm -hmm. In a way, I don't think he gets to show that much. No, not that often in, life, in yeah, his career. Because he's mostly playing kind of the straight up guy, the friend guy, the nice guy, the, the middle America guy. He's not playing this almost fire and brimstone yeah. person that he becomes in this scene. Even in Patton. He's second banana because George C. Scott has to really stand out and he has to kind of underplay whatever George is doing. So he never gets that real like big speech. And yeah. this is one of those rare moments, as you said, Steve, where he gets a big speech. Yeah. And it's great acting work because once again, remember this, we're talking about the method. We're talking about this time when actors were like studying certain techniques. You see Malden is creating this character who is finding his voice in this moment. Right. To finally play a hand. To finally take a risk beyond the safe space of the church. He is out there and he talks and he risks and he gets embarrassed, insulted, and attacked by these hoods, these thugs. Um, I completely agree. And I think there's two, like the two incidents for him, the transformative moments are one, Edie says... Any stories that have those saints hiding out in the church, yeah, that's one. Right. And two is Dugan saying, if I go, are you going to go with me? Right. Those two moments transform this person. I think without those two moments, he would have been a perfectly good priest in the parish, working out of the church, doing good work. Yeah. But he wouldn't have been this guy. Safe work. Safe work. Yeah. Yeah. And he says... Some people think the crucifixion only took place on Calvary. Taking Joey Doyle's life to stop him from testifying is a crucifixion. And dropping a sling on K.O. Dugan because he was ready to spill his guts tomorrow, that's a crucifixion. And every time the mob puts the crusher on a good man, tries to stop him from doing his duty as a citizen, it's a crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have there ever been a speech in a film like this before? Oh, I'm sure, man. I, nothing comes to mind right offhand. I, I mean, there must be something in... Well, I guess what year is this? 50, 54. 54. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I, and I dislike people who say there's never been anything like this before <laughs> without actually studying everything that has come before. It's the greatest speech ever. But in my <laughs> mind... In my, I said we weren't going to go there. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> in my mind, I, I can't think of another, another speech that takes the most brutal and profound imagery from christian theology and places it with the people in this way like mm. i i don't i can't think of someone that because because and to be clear like religion was wasn't something that was talked about in this way on right, film right, like right. you'd have a movie like ben-hur which comes out two years later or the silent version which comes out before right. or the ten commandments and it was sort of religion is the big sort of epic sort of you know religious text yeah you know, or you even had the father, you had Bing Crosby and Going My Way or something right, like right, that. Right. But you didn't have this guy who says, you know, yeah. that this is a crucifixion. Yeah. And anybody who sits around and lets it happen, keep silent about something he knows has happened, shares the guilt of it just as much as the Roman soldier who pierced the flesh of our Lord. I think the closest thing was maybe Chaplin's speech in Great Dictator. Yeah. But it's a lot of, it's a more softer speech, a more like coming together speech. Yeah. This is a speech about rallying the troops oh, yeah. uh, in a battle here that 
maybe they're afraid to fight. Well, and and to be really clear, he's talking to uh, the people yes. in a way that movies didn't talk. Because this is the yeah. first, I, re- I can say that in a lot of ways, this is the first really realistic portrayal. You know the other movie we did that actually I think had a similar thing? What's that? Is Grapes of Wrath. Yeah, sure. I think Grapes of Wrath, actually Grapes of Wrath is a, so this this proves me wrong. Okay. Is that because Grapes of Wrath is using religious imagery and is connecting it to the ordinary people that are the Joad family and all the other people coming out of the Dust Bowl right. and, and treating Tom Joad as a religious figure and treating John Carradine as a as a Christ-like figure. Mm. And that that's certainly, that is relating to yeah, it. Yeah. But even that's in a more mythical, poetic sense than this is. Right. And of course, who's listening to that line about anyone who keeps their silence is like the Romans who pierce the skin of our Lord? Terry Malloy. Terry Malloy. Uh, and that's when people start throwing things at him. Yeah. Yeah. And then Dugan warned him. Yeah. They'll come after you turned around collar or not. Yep. Yeah. And they, and they tell Fada. him, I love this moment. They say, go back to your church. Yeah. And he says, boys, this is my church. And if you don't think Christ is down here on the waterfront, you've got another guest coming. Mm. And they throw more stuff at him. Yep. Um, and Terry starts to say, this is the, this is the moment. Terry says, don't do that. And they say, whose side are you on, boy? Yeah. Well, here's the irony of the situation. Johnny sent him down there to teach him a lesson and, mm. and, and yeah. send him a message. But the message he was intending to send to Terry got completely turned around, and Terry got a completely different message. And in an indirect way, Johnny Friendly begins the process of his own demise by sending him down there. That is a great... I hadn't thought about that. Mm. But that well, and this is why they have totally misjudged the character of Terry Malloy. Yeah, which is you know how what they saw him as. Yeah, uh, a bum, a bum. Yeah, I thought a, a dumb guy, a dumb yeah. boxer. Yep, they they didn't know, they didn't see yeah. that in there was this character, right? And I don't know that Terry Malloy knew it. I don't think we've seen it yet. If we're watching this movie for the first time, I agree. Not till he gets into that car with Charlie later on. Yeah, every morning when the hiring boss blows his whistle. Jesus stands alongside you in the shape up. He sees why some of you get picked and some of you get passed over. I like the word passed over. Mm. Passed over, as a Jewish person, that is a religious word. True. You know, that is a phrase that is about the angel of death. I'm sure that's intentional, man. I'm sure it is too. He sees the family men worrying about getting their rent and getting food in the house for the wife and the kids. He sees you selling your souls to the mob for a day's pay. Someone throws a can at him this time. And you know who stands up is... Edie's dad, yeah. Joey, Joey Doyle's dad. The next bum to throw something deals with me. I don't care if he's twice my size. And the thing that's great about what Father Barry does here is that he's not, he's being judgmental but not cruel. Right. You know what I mean? Like he's saying, I know, you're worried. How are you going to feed your kids? But I'm telling you, in doing that, you're still selling your soul yep. for a day's pay. Now what does Christ think of the easy money boys who do none of the work and take all of the gravy? And how does he feel about the fellas who wear $150 suits and diamond rings on you union dues and your kickback money? You remember who he cuts to then? Johnny Friendly. And Charlie. Yeah, and Charlie. Yeah. This speech is so incredible because it still resonates now. And there have been many unions and union members who have felt this way. And seeing their union leadership get fat off the dues, off their money, off the stuff. And there have been other, of course, great union leaders who have done incredible work for their people. But the big being a SAG guy, this this is the complaint every single election cycle. That the incumbent president has been taking your dues, taking your money, corrupt, blah, blah, blah. I had Matthew Modine on the Deep Cut recently, and he talked about it because he ran for president, mm. and he got mischaracterized in some horrible ways during the campaign, and I was just like shocked at we the SAG is supposed to be about inclusivity of everybody, but the way they're willing to run a campaign like they run a campaign for president or uh, the nominee of a party, it's just disgusting. Well, here, here, I want I want to say something about on the waterfront first, and yeah. then I want to say something about SAG. Sure. So the thing that's weird about on the waterfront is that for most of the time, the union is standing up against the bosses. Right. Like that's the normal conflict. Right. Is that and the speech could be exactly the same. 
because someone who is deciding whether or not to go on strike against their bosses yeah. is someone who's saying, I'm going to sacrifice my rent and the food that's going into my kid's mouth because I'm being mistreated and we got to stand up and that's yeah. what a strike is. In this weird case, they're actually standing up against their own union yeah. that, that is against well, them. That's my point. Yeah. So so, so the, what's so... And yet the, the basic choice that the worker at the bottom of the ladder has to make is the same. Yeah. Do I sacrifice what I have right now that is insufficient, cruel, and unfair in order to get something that is fair, knowing that it could mean I'm totally destroyed in the process? Yeah. You know, that's the question. Uh, the weird thing about SAG to me, and because and, 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 I've dealt with SAG as a director, yeah. and I, I 100% am pro- Union, particularly particularly when it comes to SAG, because sure. actors are so vulnerable to abuse. Yeah, because you have tens of thousands of people coming out to Hollywood, going to New York, and they're desperate and they're young, and there are a lot of unscrupulous producers who take advantage of that and will really, really do horrible things unless there's a union like SAG to protect them. Right. But what's weird about SAG, if you look at the steel workers or the auto union or any or the longshoremen or any other union and you looked at the bottom paid guy and the top paid guy like someone who is their first day on the job at mm. the on the factory floor and someone who is a a 40-year veteran near retirement the difference in the pay might be two to three times maybe yeah. four times if you look at the lowest paid sag actor <laughs> And the top paid SAG actor, Tom Cruise, yeah. the difference is like 3,000 times. Yeah, it's astronomical. You know, and, and the thing is, is that the people that run SAG are mostly up near those top people. Right. You know, and so there's no other union that is dealing with the most visible, famous people in the world are right. in your union. And those are not the people that need protection. No. And also, they count on the indifference of the majority of the members of the union to not vote. To not right. get involved because it to them they feel like it really doesn't matter. Well, and 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 the thing too, and one thing that I'm, I've experienced, you probably experienced yeah. too, is like let's say I wanted to make a movie with you, mm -hmm. and you and I put together two hundred dollars to make the movie. You you and I wrote it together. We're passionate about it. I'm the director. You're going to be the star. Yeah, we can't do it. You know, it's very hard for us to do it. The rules have changed a little bit for right. this because I had you're a SAG actor, so I had to make a deal with SAG. Yep. You know what I mean? And so so these and 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 I should say. This has gotten a lot better in the last 10 years. We don't want to need to go into how SAG operates. Right, right. There's more ways that we can make this work. But there, there's a lot, you know, actors just want to work. Yeah. They want to build your reel. Yeah. And sometimes SAG acts as a preventative to making that stuff happen. Yeah. yeah. All right. So hey. big movie we're in. That's right. <laughs> Enough digression about SAG. Because right now, there's a moment where the thugs are going to shut down Father Barry. Yeah. And they make a move. And what does Terry do? Knocks him down. Yep, beats him up. Throws some punches. That is the turning point of the film. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and everybody sees it. Charlie sees it. I don't know there's any turning back from this moment. Yeah. You know? Um, He's chosen a side. Yeah. Edie and Pop, they see it. Right. And Father Barry sees it, and he goes on. But remember, Christ is always with you. Christ is in the shape up. He's in the hatch. He's in the unit. He's kneeling right here beside Dugan. And he's staying with all of you. If you do it to the least of mine, you do it to me. And what they did to Joey and what they did to Dugan, they're doing to you. And you. You. All of you! And he's looking at Terry. Um, this is Eli Kazan speaking to America. Yeah. America is down here. People are losing the connection, right? This is post-World War II. This is right when people are starting to go out to the suburbs and separate connection. All this is happening in, in the in, in the country. So people are chasing the buck over this idea of brotherhood and sisterhood. And so I think this is what he's talking about. It sounds like to me this is what he's talking about, this change that's happening in the country. Right? So, it's, to me, it's more fundamental than that. I mean, like to, we, mm. we've talked about this, the subject of... Jesus has come up, you know, many times sure. in the film. Most particularly, I'd say in Ben Hur. Yeah, Ben Hur. Um, and and I've said before that as a, I'm a Jewish man and I'm an atheist, and I, the philosophy of Jesus means a lot to me. Yeah. And if you, and to me, if you, if I tick, pick the greatest hits, you know, they are He without sin shall cast the first stone. It's a rich man can't, has as much chance of getting into heaven as, as you know a camel going through the eye of a needle. Right. It's uh, turn the other cheek, and it's that which you do the least of 
my brothers, you do to me. Yeah. And all of those are about the poor. Mm -hmm. They're about forgiveness. They're about uh, lack of judgment. Right. And they're about taking care of those people that are needy. And it's amazing to me that mm -hmm. in this film and throughout our history, we continually seem to forget this point. Oh, yeah. That I'm the atheist guy, and like, I feel like I need to remind <laughs> some religious people sometimes, like, hey, the basic, the, and maybe someone else thinks these aren't the greatest hits. Yeah. Maybe they look to some other quotes and they can explain why we should be going to war and making lots of money and have having lots of vengeance against all sorts of other people. But to me, from my reading of those texts, those are not the greatest hits. Yeah. You know, these are the greatest hits, and that's what Father Barry's saying right now. Yeah. And only you, only you with God's help have the power to knock him out for good. That's a great moment. He looks mm -hmm. at Terry, right at Terry, he looks right at Terry. Yep. And then he leans down and he says, okay, KO, looking right at Duke. Yep. Wow. All right, come on, come on, let's go. Break it up, let's go away. And there's a gesture from Johnny, okay. And they start to lift that net up with Father Barry standing on it. Yeah. It's an amazing and powerful shot that as he's rise, literally lifting up, mm -hmm. rising up among the men, the score is just killing it, Leonard Bernstein's st score. And I have one other thing to say about this. Do you remember at the beginning of last podcast where I mentioned the real people that this was based on? Mm -hmm. And one of them is this guy, Fa Father Corridan. And Father Corridan is who Father Barry is based on. He really was fighting on the waterfront for the rights of the workers against the mob for years. Yeah. Carl Malden is wearing his hat and coat in this scene. Wow. That is Father Corden's actual hat and coat. Ah. Yeah. It's great. An amazing scene. Uh, we're on the rooftop. Uh, Edie is looking for Terry, and she finds him lying down. Mm -hmm. I think she's in Joey's coop. Yeah. It, and it's cold. By the way, it really was cold when they shot this. It was uh, The actors were freezing mm. half the time. Um, th there's... The skylight's kind of glowing in the background on the rooftop. It's a beautiful shot. Uh, there's pigeons around. There's kind of a look between them. She's mm -hmm. brought him Joey's uh, jacket yeah. to wear, which is really significant. She's kind of above him. And there's a real nervousness. And she leans down and she rests her face against the, her, his chest. He touches her head. And they look at each other and it's a very close... And that kiss is a beautifully shot first kiss. Agreed. And we fade out. Uh, we're at the ch church, and Carl Malden is walking past the pews, and Terry wants to talk to him. Yeah. He blows right by him. <laughs> He's outside. Malden's walking fast. Terry runs to catch up to him and finally grabs him and says, I'm the one who set Joey up for the knockoff. Yeah. And what I think Malden's reaction is so interesting. It's like, I don't want your confession. Yeah. You know? Like, and, and, and it's interesting too, we don't exactly hear everything that they say. Um, and he, and then we do hear him say, I just thought they were going to lean on it. I didn't know they would knock him off. And then it's so, be I think the honesty in, uh, in uh, Brando's at this moment is great. And I tried to tell Edie the other night. I really tried to, I want to tell her she's the first nice thing that ever happened to me. It's the first nice thing that ever happened to me. I, 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 I and, and I think there's, a hundred percent truth there. Yeah, I I think he I think he did want to tell her. I think he couldn't bring himself. And and Father Barry is so hard yeah. in this moment. What are you going to do about it? What do you mean about telling her? Yes, about telling her the commission, your subpoena. I know you got a subpoena. And Brando says it's like carrying a monkey on your back. And Father Barry's response is the question is who rides who. Yeah, that's a great line. But you know, if I spill my life, I ain't worth a nickel. And how much is your soul worth if you don't? That's yeah, that's right out there. They're asking me to put the finger on my own brother. And Johnny Funny used to take me to ball games when I was ball a kid. Ball games don't break my heart. I wouldn't care if he gave you a life pass to the polo grounds. So you've got a brother, eh? Well, let me tell you something. You've got some other brothers. And they're getting a the shorthand while your Johnny's getting mustard on his face at the polo grounds. And then Father Barry says, good luck, and he walks away. Yeah. He is tough. Man, he is playing this. He's playing hardball with he Terry is. Malloy. And you have to be with Terry. Yeah. And Terry goes, is that all you got to say? And Father says, come here. 
and he points down to kind of below them. They're in a beautiful real location, and there is Edie walking along what looks like a canal or a, a you know, some water right. spillway or something. Come on, why don't you tell her? Brando's reaction and his realization that this is what he has to do is yeah. great. Yeah. And he says, okay. And I love that he says thanks. Yeah. And we see in the distance him going down to see Edie. And we see him start to talk to her. And they're together. And just as she starts to explain and you see her react, we hear this, you know, uh, ship horn. Yeah. And so we can't actually hear what he says. Mm -hmm. I, it's a brilliant moment. Yep. And she cries. And there's a nasty music sting when we know that he's fully told her, I'm responsible for, for your brother's death. It right. was me. and But we never hear any of it. Uh, and she runs away and Terry's left alone. It's a great scene. Yep. Um, and, and, I, and I have a, 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 just a filmmaking thing. Okay. okay. A, 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 so so what, you might watch this scene and you go, oh, this is so brilliant that he doesn't let us hear it because then we can kind of imagine the reaction in our own head and we can sort of feel it and construct it and that makes it more powerful rather than just hearing it, which would be less powerful. And that's yeah. totally true. But I also want to kind of explain maybe how that idea came about. Because one thing you don't ever want to do is repeat stuff in a movie. Yeah. Unless you really need to make sure the audience knows a thing. <laughs> But if you know a thing, ha hearing someone say the thing again is actually boring. And so frequently what you're doing is trying to figure out ways that I don't have to repeat myself. <laughs> and I think this was like, this is one of those moments where a great director figures out a great way to do a thing yeah. without having to repeat himself. And so he gets to have both. That's what I think is going on here. Yeah, that's fair. Um, back on the rooftop, cops there. And the the kids are up there and seeing him and... Mm -hmm. Terry shows up and they tell him the cops there he's and Terry heads over and this great shot with a cop in the foreground and Terry in the background right and the cops just kind of complaining about it I love the way he's playing it that he's yeah. complaining about having to walk up the stairs and oh this is such a pain what are you climbing for well it's worth it if we can tell the waterfront story the way the people have a right to hear it don't you think and they end up at Joey's coop yep and again, the cop doesn't ask him any questions, except, didn't I see you at the garden? Right. With a fellow called Wilson. Of course, they're talking about the fight. That fight. Yeah. And Terry basically says, Yeah. I I was going to win. That guy couldn't knock me out. Right. And he even, he, he even describes like how he was fighting him. Um, because, man, that story is just busting to get out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then the cop leaves. You know, like right. he doesn't, he never asks him anything. Why do you think the cop plays it that way? Well, listen, this, I just saw a film call, for the second time, called The Report, the Adam Driver film. It's a fantastic film. Can't recommend that enough when it comes out or when it comes out on Blu-ray or digital. But he says there's a moment where you find out how these two people came in charge of the CIA torture program. Oh. And they boot out this person who spoke um, Arabic, right? Or I don't know offhand what they speak uh, with the Taliban, but... Pashtun. Pashtun. Uh, well, he can speak it, and he is creating rapport with them so that he can get information. And he says the best way to get information out of a suspect or out of a hostage or out of a prisoner is to create rapport. Right. They will, they will tell you things not knowing they're telling you things. But the other side is shown where they waterboard and they torture them, yeah. and they can't get any information. Right. Right, and here's for everybody who's listening. They well, never the information's got information. Not reliable, right? Because information's the person who's being tortured, they're going to say anything. Right, exactly. You or know? they're going to tell you stuff you already know. Yeah, just to kind. Of, but this is what this is why I think this happens here. It's it's a more matter of like connection and making sure they have uh, a rapport. So that this comes, so that this is the conversation. This is where it goes. You know what I'm saying? Well, well, and the other thing I think he's doing is he knows exactly what's about to happen, right. which is the kids are going to go tell Johnny Friendly yeah. that Terry was talking to the cop. Right. There was. Uh, I'm trying to remember what movie it's in. There, there's a. Uh, oh, you know, it's, it's it's silly, but it is in Jackie Chan's Police Force. Okay. Where they're interrogating. There's the girl who's supposed to turn evidence, and the cop goes in and sits with her for five minutes in silence. Right. And she walks out of the lawyers, going, "What did you tell her?" And she said, "Nothing. He didn't say anything." And now they think he's she's right. lying. And that's sort of what's happening here because Charlie, um, Johnny, now is certain that Terry is iffy, mm -hmm. you know, and so he starts talking to Charlie. Um, 
and says, you know, we gotta we gotta do something about this. Yeah. And Charlie's like going, no, he's he's a he's a good kid. Um because the whole crew is getting in behind Johnny. Yeah. To make this happen. And Charlie's the last one like defending Terry. Well, it, it, I mean, like, to, to be clear, they are 100% right. Right. Terry is waffling. Terry is right on the edge. And so Charlie going, no, no, that's not going to happen. Charlie's actually wrong about this. Yeah. I ain't interested in his mental condition. All I want to know is, is he D&D or is he a canary? I wish I knew. So do I, Charlie. For your sake. <laughs> if you don't give him, I think the thing he says is the Jerry G. Is that what it is? I don't know what that expression so. means. I mean, I, I get, I kind of get what it means, but I don't know where right, it comes right, from. Right, right, um, right. And Charlie's like, I can't do that. I mean, all right, maybe the boy is out of line, but he's just a confused kid. Confused kid. Confused kid. <laughs> Lee Jacob has one of the best repeating what you just said. Outrage. Oh yeah, he's great. First he crosses me in public and gets away with it, then the next joke up pretty soon, I'm just another fella around here. Johnny, I can't do that. And don't. And the reaction from Charlie yeah. in that moment, because <laughs> what does then don't mean? It means he's he, he's on the uh, line up next to get killed. That's Yeah, well, and that Terry's going to get killed. Yeah, I both mean, of them. They're both going to get yeah, killed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Johnny, he's my kid brother. That's for you to figure out. And Charlie gets up and he heads out. It's the first time Charlie's had a loss in status in the film. Yeah. But the whole film has got a certain kind of above the dudes. But once this went goes down, even the thugs around him and the guy running the, the yard looks at him as lower than. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we've arrived at the scene. Yeah, man. I mean, like, we've this, this scene has already come up on the Cinephiles multiple times. This yes. is one of the clips. That gets played. The quote from Brando in this scene. This yeah. is, uh, as in terms of a scene of method acting, in terms of performance. I mean, this is one of the great scenes in film history. I also think it's one of the most heartbreaking scenes in film history. Oh as well. yeah, and not just on Terry's part. Agree. That on was Charlie's how I well. really watched it this last time. Yeah, was I because I'd always just watched Brando because yeah. it's really hard not of to. Of course. And 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 this time twice I watched the scene a few times because I wanted to write down really what all the lines were. Yeah, is watching it. I was like, okay, I'm just going to watch Steiger. Wow. Yeah. What he does is amazing. Yeah. Well, and here's what's interesting. And this is, you, you know, you've talked on this show a lot about playing status yeah. and what status means. Well, what's so weird is that in this film, there's no question that Charlie is of higher status than Terry. Right. But mm -hmm. in reality, this is Steiger's first movie. Yeah. Brando is a huge star. Yeah. Brando, I mean, not only is Brando a huge star, but he has completely transformed the world of acting and the style of acting that Steiger comes out of, of method acting. Brando is like God. Right. And so here's a scene where he has to play high status and his brother and Terry, Brando has to play low status when in the reality is he's scared shitless of right. Brando. Right. You but know? in the reality of their relationship, once he gets in the car, the status has switched. Because Charlie is desperate to make Terry do something. But Terry is so determined to do this that the status switches. Um, Sam Spiegel, the producer, was so cheap that he wouldn't pay for a real taxi or a real picture car. And it shows. Because <laughs> the, the first thing is normally you would, you would actually get a taxi. You would yeah. haul it in a truck through city streets and that's how you film it. We can't do that. Then the next thing is you would actually get a taxi and sh film inside the taxi or get a, get a real taxi and get one that you can cut into pieces. Yeah. They didn't really do that either. <laughs> then you was like, okay, we're just going to get the back seat of a taxi, which isn't really even a taxi, but right. we're going to build a set around it or do rear projection or something so we see City going by. No, we're not going to spend the money on that either. <laughs> they just have like a warehouse and a, and a half a car. You're right. And it was actually a crew. And they're going like, how are we even going to do this? And it was a crew member that came up with the idea of like the Venetian blinds in back. Oh. And that's the reason you're not seeing that they're just sitting in a warehouse. Oh, and of course, funny. this is poor man's process where they're just kind of shining some lights at them. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. Where do? Uh, you just go to River Street and I'll tell you where to stop. I thought we was going to the garden. Yeah, but uh, I want to cover a bet on the way over. Besides, this will give us a chance to talk. And Charlie asks about the subpoena. I mean, you know, the guys would know you well enough to know that you're not a cheese eater, but they think maybe you should not be on the outside so much. A little on the inside, have a few little things working for you down at the docks. And he offers him a job. Yeah. You know, a job that's going to have more money and tries less work. Him. He tries to buy him. Yep. Um, he tries to buy the whistleblower. How interesting. Steady job, a uh, couple extra potatoes. That's all I want. Oh, 
Sure, that's great when you're a kid, but uh, you're getting on. You're pushing 30, Slugger. You know, it's time to, to think about getting some ambition. Well, I always figured I'd live a little bit longer without it. Mm. <laughs> Maybe. Very smart thing to say, by the way. Yeah. And he's talking about this job and all the money he's going to get. And then Charlie says, or Terry says, I get all that dough for not doing nothing. You don't do anything and you don't say anything. You understand? And Terry has a reaction. Yeah. Do you think Charlie has spoken to him that directly about his about Johnny and what he has to do for him? I think it's been a long time since he's spoken to him directly about anything. Oh. But I think when he puts his foot down, this is the tone of voice he uses and the way he delivers what he has to say with Terry in the past. The thing that he discovers here in the car, Charlie does, is that old method doesn't work anymore. Yeah. It's all of a sudden antiquated. Well, I think when Charlie was the big brother and the smarter brother and knew all the ropes and Terry just gave himself over to this person. And I think it's like been a process that probably started before the movie started. Yeah. You know, and then with Joey's death and then clearly with Dugan's death and with Edie and all these things. Right. Terry's become his own person. There's a prequel movie where Johnny Friendly finds Terry through Charlie at 15 years old, convinces Charlie to become his manager. Terry's not smart enough to ask questions, and then uses the kid to make money to make wow. money. Sure. Until the moment he asks him to throw the fight, yeah, so that he can make more money because he's built this guy up to such an unbeatable beast that now he has to take the money on the other guy because yeah. the odds are more in his favor if he does that. I, I, I love that that. Uh... By the way, I think that's a great idea. No, I, I I love that uh, the way Terry is still thinking through this. He, even in this scene, he's still kind of processing it. Season now. He says, yeah. there's more than this than I thought, Charlie. I'm telling you, there's a lot more. He's trying to bring Charlie to his side, Yeah, ironically. You don't mean that you're thinking of testifying against some people that we might know? I don't know, Charlie. You're right, Steve. It's a pretty good point. He's figuring it out as he yeah. talks to Charlie about it. And he's like looking around. He's not a... He's, how can I say this? He's not a stupid man. He's a deliberate man. Yeah. And so once he makes the decision, it's tough to turn yeah. him around on the decision. Yeah. 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 Because he's... Well, he's stubborn. He yes. is a guy literally who could take a beating. Yes. You know, and that takes stubbornness. I mean, I'm telling you, I don't know, Charlie. That's what I want to talk to you about. Listen, Terry, you know how much those piers are worth that we control through the local? I know that. All right, you think that Johnny's going to jeopardize the whole setup for one rubber lip ex tanker who's walking that. on his heels? What the? And then Terry says, I could have been better. I could have been a lot better, the Charlie. The point is, we don't have much time. That is a total non sequitur, mm -hmm. except in his mind. In his mind, these things are connected. Yeah. Yes. I think. Well, here's a question for you. Okay. If Char if Terry didn't throw that fight, if yeah. Charlie didn't pressure Terry into throwing that fight, and, and let's say he didn't become the world champion, right? He had a yeah. you know a moderate boxing career, and then his career was over. Either way, right? Would he be Johnny Friendly's man? No, I think he might have been. You think so? I think throwing that fight put the bug in his brain six years ago. That's been eating at him and eating at no, him and eating at him, and that and that is what puts this over the edge. Do you think if he hadn't thrown the fight, he wouldn't be Johnny Friendly's boy, or he would be still? I think he might be. I think he might be. Oh, I see. So he wouldn't even question it. He yeah. would just go along with it. Because this is, he's had, he's had deep anger towards Johnny Friendly and yeah. his brother that he has been repressing for a long time. Right, it, but I think the dangerous thing about, and I, I hear your point of view, and I think... It, I don't know. Of course, well, right, yeah. of course not. We're speculating, which is what we enjoy doing on the show, but I think it would be... I think it would undercut his character if that was true. Because I think this was coming either way. Right. As he got older, as he became more mature, as he was opening his eyes to what was happening, I think this conversation with Johnny Friendly was going to come one way or another, win or lose. Yeah. That, it's, that, well, and that's a really good... But there's no question yeah. Yeah. that this fight... Yes. Is, it's the crux it, of everything. Yeah. I could have been a lot better, The Charlie. point is we don't have much time. I'm telling you, I haven't made up my mind well, yet. Well, make up your mind before we get to 437 River Street. What's that, Charlie? Where, where are we going, Charlie? Before we get the Listen wind. to me, Terry. Take the job. Just take it. No questions. Take it. And then he pulls a gun. Oh, my God. It's such a desperate move, but it also solidifies how the status has switched completely now. The desperation of Charlie. Yeah. And it's coming from a place of love, like, 
I have no other, look, this is not a you know, touchy feely. We all went to therapy and figured out our feelings type of place. This is an old school male type of Neanderthal place. And so emotions and feelings aren't expressed in the correct manner. He doesn't pull the gun to threaten Terry to do it. He pulls the gun, but he has no other option in his mind, no other tactic that he can use. So he's desperate and he pulls the gun and he's almost apologetic or almost sad in having to ask because he's like, you don't understand. If you don't do this, you die. You're my brother. Yeah. I love you. You you die. Well, and maybe I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's like, what is 437 River Street? 437 River Street is where you die. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm trying, like, uh, uh, the, and this is what's so amazing about the mm. scene is that, is that on the one hand, a brother watches another, his brother pull a gun on him. Yeah. Like the, the level of betrayal of that and the shock of that and the pain of that is so huge. But on the other hand, the reason he's pulling his gun is on some level to save Terry's life. Of course it is. It's because he loves him. Yes. That's how fucked up these people well, are. Well, but and, it's honesty. Well, and like the degree to which he loves Terry and the degree to which he's saving his own skin, we don't. Right. I mean, I think he does love Terry. Yes. I but I don't think too. he, I mean, I, I, I think he's also been abusive and manipulative and controlling sure. and dismissive of Terry as yeah. well. But, um, but Terry's reaction is the key here, Steve. And I, I got real emotional watching it this time around because Terry is, Terry's like, he feels so, he feels pity for his brother. Like he's not even shocked by the gun. The gun doesn't even shock him. It's the shock that his brother would go to that level to do this and how useless it is and how pathetic it is to Terry. I don't mean pathetic in a negative way. I mean pathetic like it's sad. And he feels, he's just, well, it's, it's just the way he looks around. He's like, oh, Charlie, why? Why would you do this? Why well, it, would you do that? Well, and he says, he says, oh, Charlie. And then he says, wow. Wow. Like he's, like you, why? Well, and it's also that, right. like, I, I thought I knew what our relationship right. was. Right. But now you, I mean, you pulled a gun on me, and and so and I, and I I don't mean to make the comparison, but I have like you know my bro, my of uh, my closest friend in the world who betrayed me, in my opinion, right? And I remember as the whole thing was betrayed is the wrong word I would say is that we we our friendship ended, and I remember as the whole thing was happening, of the feeling of oh Charlie, wow yeah, because I was so I was so shocked I was just like I don't understand I can't believe that this person who I love so much yeah would would hurt me in this way right. and treat me in this way. And it was so, and watching Brando's performance is so vulnerable and so sad and so open and so yeah. honest. He feels sorry for his brother. Yeah. He feels sorry for his brother who is a higher position in the company, makes more money, dresses better. But in that moment, he regresses back to something. And to me, I think it goes back to them growing up as kids where now all of a sudden Terry is back in a position of power over his brother Charlie because he could always beat up Charlie growing up mm. and I think Terry protected Charlie growing up oh. and so Charlie reversed it once Terry started into this certain area of his life Charlie now became the protector of Terry and Terry deferred to Charlie because this was a game he didn't understand see it's funny like in my imaginary mm. mind of their childhood again we're doing another our prequels sure sure is that uh, they protect each other mm. is that Charlie is the smarter one and the guy who knew how to play the system, right. he was getting, he was working the system at the kids' home and getting them food, and he was, well, he knew maybe. where to steal from, and he Certainly. knew where to do, and he was doing all that stuff. But when someone came, when Charlie got caught, yeah, Terry was protecting Charlie. Right, that's right. kind of how I, I see the relationship. I see that. Surely. So, so the oh Charlie and the wow and this moment that's improvised from Brando. <laughs> of course it is. There was apparently a lot of improvisation in the scene because Brando didn't really wasn't really happy with the script, <laughs> and he kept improvising. This is what happened apparently is that Kazan let him improvise. They yeah. improvised stuff about Yankees games, about all this other stuff that was going on, and then after a certain point, Kazan said to Brando, "Buddy, cut the crap." Yeah, and they went back to the script. <laughs> and I'll let you play. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, and I just love, I love that he, he let him go. Yeah. And then I love Buddy cut the crap. And, and, and what I wonder, and this is what I, if, if I got to interview Kazan, what I would ask him is, do you think that Brando was afraid of doing this scene straight up? And that he was doing all this improvisation Certainly. to avoid 
getting into this pain that's about to happen? Um, be, and I have no idea. I would love to know the answer. Like, wh- why did you let him go? And why did you choose to say, buddy, cut the crap? Well, Wells says, talks about it as well. And Daniel Day, I mean, like, every great actor is always afraid of being found out that they're a fraud. And so Brando, I would not surprise me at all if Brando was doing all this because he didn't feel he could get to the emotional place with that scene. Watch Rod Steiger's reaction in this yeah, moment. Yeah. Because he puts that gun down pretty quick. He does because he's embarrassed. Uh, well, and he, and he le- well, and it, I think it's more than that too. He knows he can't shoot his brother. Right. And he leans his head back in the cab. And I think at that moment he knows he's going to die. Yes. And I think they both, like I said, I think they both revert back to being kids again. It's all the adulthood is stripped away, and it's just this moment of relationship between them. Because, because, and the weird thing about this scene is that we have Charlie taking Terry essentially to be killed yeah. and having to threaten his life. And in not going through with it, in letting Terry go, Charlie is on some level accepting his own death. Yes, he, absolutely. The moment he lets Terry go because he knows the driver is supposed to do this, He's basically signed his death warrant. And Terry, by not show, shutting up, is killing his brother. Yes. Now, he doesn't know that. Right. I don't think he has that thought in his brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and and as you say, they go back to the kids because Charlie looks at Terry and says, talks about him when he was a fighter, when he yeah. weighed 168, and says that he was beautiful. Yeah. And that he, he, he was so good and, oh, we got you the wrong manager. So wrong manager. That was the pro- That's how Charlie has rationalized yeah, yeah, what's right. happened. It wasn't him, Charlie. It was you. You remember that night in the garden? You came down my dressing room and said, Kid, this ain't your night. We're going for the price on Wilson. You remember that? This ain't your night. My night. I could have taken Wilson apart. Could he have taken Wilson apart? Yes. I think so, too. I have no doubts in my mind. I, 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 I don't know that Terry could have been the champion. You Maybe know? not. I, Lamada was a champion. He wasn't no damn mental gymnastics guy. I have nothing. I'm not talking about smarts. <laughs> what what I'm saying is that every single person, not every single person, that's an exaggeration. Most people in that position believe that they could have been. That's how oh, you're sure, there. Of course. Of if course. you watch interviews with fighters, they'll say, yeah. I know in my heart I can win. Yeah. I mean, because you're never going to stop me, and yet they get stopped. Yeah. And you see this over and over and over again. And after the fight, they know, like, I could have won. Right. You know, that's, that's, you know, you talk to every athlete, you talk to every contestant on American Idol, every, yeah. you know, everyone believes because you have to have that belief. Mm-hmm. And so I was thinking about it is Terry, has Terry convinced himself of something that isn't true about who he is? But I don't think Maybe. that is. I, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think, I think he could have beaten Wilson. Yes. I think the scene works more powerfully if he could have beaten Wilson. I agree. So what happens? He gets the title shot outdoors in a ballpark, and what do I get? A one way ticket to Palookaville. It's such a great line. <laughs> so, one way ticket to Palookaville is awesome. You was my brother, Charlie. You should have looked out for me a little bit. You should have taken care of me just a little bit, so I wouldn't have to take them dives for the short end money. So it wasn't the only. It wasn't the yeah. only time he took a dive. Dives, yeah. yeah. And Charlie, Charlie's rationalization is, oh, I had some bets down for you, saw some money. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's face it. It was you, child. Oh, yeah. What a what a moment. What a moment. This conversation has been coming, as you said, Steve, for years since that conversation in the locker room when he told him to take a dive against Wilson. This conversation was coming in their relationship, and it finally happened. And it could have been in a position where Terry was still submissive and Charlie the dominant position, but it is not. It's where it's where Terry is the dominant and Charlie is submissive, and he lays it all out to him, and he says, you know, it's your fault. It's not Johnny's. It's your fault. Yeah. And maybe what you said is right, Steve. Like, they protected each other growing up as kids. You were supposed to protect me a little right. bit. Like, I did my, I held up my end of the bargain right. all this time. But here was this one critical moment, and you didn't, and you screwed me. And this is your fault. This You did this, Charlie. Not, not Johnny. You. You got to carry the weight of that. And I think that's, I think when, and we'll get to it in just a second, like when Charlie lets him go, that's Charlie accepting uh, responsibility and blame for what he did 
and then ultimately and protecting his brother, right, and protecting his yeah. brother, and then one last time, and then yeah. ultimately accepting the punishment of having made that decision six years ago. Um, it allows him a noble death. I agreed. I totally agree. Mm. It's funny. So you know what? When we first started in the last episode, I said that this movie didn't hit me as hard when I was younger as it hit me when I was older. Mm. Well, I think when I was younger, I thought I was a contender, <laughs> and now the I could have been a contender feeling. Mm. And the the, I, the word I use isn't bum, but the number of times I thought of myself as a failure, you know, and didn't live up to the things I was supposed to do. Right. You know, that's the constant voice at the back of my head. Well, you know, I think that's why the movie speaks to so many people, Steve, still universally generation to generation, because a majority of people in life feel this way, that they yeah. had their shots or they didn't get a shot or something happened that uh, undercut their shot. And they never arrived to where they wanted to be. And, you know, it's a larger issue to have about the idea of success and the way it's portrayed and what does it really mean and blah, blah, blah. But, like, I think a lot of people connect to them because a lot of people feel like Terry Malloy. They think they could have been somebody. I'll tell you, in a small microcosm thing, with the Schmodown, it's the same thing. Like, a lot of us have conversations on our own with each other where sure. we go, if I had just got this, if I had studied yeah. this particular thing, if I had just blah, 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 I could have... Having won a four now four belts, I'm very happy to not have to not be one of those guys who keeps or girls who keeps like coming close and not getting it. But like, I understand that feeling because I still have that feeling even with those four belts. But it's in a small microcosm what he's going through because a lot of people feel that way too. I feel that I feel that way about acting. I, I felt sure. I could have been better. I could have been good at it. I could have made a success out of it. But I didn't have that extra thing. And I didn't have that extra drive, and I didn't find myself in the right position. And I spent a lot of my twenties blaming my parents, and a lot of my in my early thirties blaming what, my parents. You bl- what were you blaming your parents? Well, about? because th- they didn't understand how to raise a, sen- a sensitive child, artistic child. They didn't put me into classes when I was young to get me trained as an actor. They didn't understand what I wanted to do with my life. My dad tried to talk me out of being an actor since I was fifteen right. years old. All those kinds of things, you know. There wasn't it, there wasn't that path there, and other people overcome those things to be successful. I don't blame my parents now at all. It's just the way life it's the way life played its hand with me, and I made my decisions, and I've come to peace with everything about that. And I don't blame my folks at all. It's the way it played out. I'm living this different other life that I am enjoying, but it's like, I, but I got lucky. So I wish I could say I've come to peace with everything. I certainly yeah, haven't. I, I find that to be such an interesting thing with you because you do carry this pain of not having achieved what you wanted to achieve. And the truth is that, like, there are many reasons for why those things happen. But you've got a great wife. You've got a child I'm, that you I'm love. Very madly. lucky. I'm an extremely yeah. lucky person. You've got friends, but it's this. You hold. You hold on to this professional thing, and and. And I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but at times it feels like because you didn't achieve it, you feel like your life is not fully defined the way you wanted it to be defined. That's no question that's how I yeah, feel. Yeah, yeah. And I know that it's not a healthy feeling. It and is. I, you know, and I try, I, I work on it and I, yeah. and, you know, try to be grateful. And I'm, you know, it's, I'm really proud of this podcast that we do. Sure, I'm, sure. I'm writing a book. I know I'm a good teacher, you know, and having, having students who are like listening and learning and going right. out and, right. and doing, you know, that's, I'm really proud of all those things. It, it's so funny. Like I can think, you know, because this is just the nature of my personality. Mm. I can think of stupid things that I did when I was nine, you know, <laughs> and still feel shitty about them. Really? Oh yeah. Oh wow. Oh yeah. There are things that I've said you know, when when I, you know, you and I had that one fight and I had said something that was kind of insensitive to you, mm. um, and I still regret it. I still feel bad. Wow. You know, I don't, I, I don't let go of shit easy. This thing, you, you know, know, I would encourage you to work on letting that, finding a way to let it go because it's like, it's, it's, we all make uh, yeah. the mistakes. We all say the wrong things. Everyone does it. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's, you just have to come to terms with understanding the intention, get forgiveness and move on. And that's the key. Yeah. Uh, for me, it happened when I went to see myself. In that film that, right, that on, movie, on, yeah. Andre Gordon yeah. directed, I, I got in the, I left the screening halfway through the screening, got in the car, and I knew I was done being on camera as an actor, and I was at peace with it. And maybe someday something will happen where you get in the car and you'll be like, "Do you I'm think okay. Andre would cast me in a movie?" Yeah, I'm sure he would. Because <laughs> maybe that's what I need. Yeah, okay. To move on, knock yourself out, but don't be surprised if you see yourself on screen. So we're back in the taxi. Yeah. Um, 
And, and I want you, all you people that want to see what good acting is, watch not just the speech that Brando makes. Sure. Watch the moment after the speech. Yeah. He does this gesture that's sort of, well, I said all I had to say. Yeah. I don't know what else to say now. And we're just going to be in this awkward moment for a second kind of gesture that is an amazing piece of acting. I think they both have the understanding of what's going to happen next. I don't think Terry, do you think Terry knows that Charlie's going to die? Yes, I think that's why he has oh, that reaction. I don't think he does. Say, so, oh, okay. I think that's why yeah. he, he has that look on his face. Ah, uh, interesting. He I knows mean, you watched it happen. much more than me. Well, and Charlie goes, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's Charlie going, okay. And he says, I'll, I'll tell you, tell him I couldn't find you. And he gives Terry the gun because he's going to need it, mm-hmm. which Charlie knows he's not going to need it. Yeah. Tells the driver to pull over. Terry gets out. And he tells the driver to. You know, take me to the garden, and the shot of the cabbie's face is so great. Yep. Because what do we know in that moment? He's going to die. He's yeah. Charlie's dead. Well, and that the, this cab driver has been listening to the yes. whole conversation. And he's going to report to Johnny Friendly and what he's happened. report to Johnny Friendly. Right. Yeah. By the way, here's the thing I didn't know. Brando wasn't there for the whole shoot. <laughs> Brando did no the surprise. two shot. He did his coverage. Yeah. And then it was time to turn around on Steiger. Brando had an analyst appointment, and he went off to see his analyst, and Steiger did the whole scene with the script supervisor. Sure, he had an analyst appointment. Yeah. I've read some terrible things about Brando and what he did to other actors and how selfish he was. As a I think it's so fucked up. I, I just can't. You know, one of, one of the basic rules of being a good mm. team player is you stay for the off-camera lines. Right. And Brando didn't stay. Yeah, a lot at, of divas don't. At the most important scene in the movie. Yeah. And this is what Steiger, Steiger said. He said he was lost, he was frightened, he was hurt, and he was embarrassed, but he had to keep going. Wow. Yeah. And he also said that uh, the greatest source of creativity is terror. Mm-hmm. The yes. horror. The horror. The <laughs> horror. Um, you know, but Brando paid for all his sins as his life went on, so you know. Terry goes back and finds Edie. She's in her nightgown, and he really forces her his way in. Which I, I thought of you watching at this time because of how you reacted to the Blade Runner situation when Harrison pushes Sean Young against the wall. This is a breaking and entering. This is no question a a sexual assault. In essence, puts her against the wall, forces himself on her, kissing her, thinking he knows better. And yes, she does acquiesce in the old like way that they did in those movies. And that's not to say that sometimes those things happen in relationships both ways. Uh, I just think this, I, I, it didn't bother me this time, but I wondered what you thought about it. So um, I, I was thinking about it too, of course. And mm. of course, anytime these things happen in films, we, you know, today for me, I'm going to look at them and think about what they are. Right. Um, the, uh, I, I do agree that people and sex and relationships are complicated. Yes. And certainly what's just happened between them in revealing his relationship to Joey and 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 Joey's death is is profound, um, but it doesn't bother me the way the Blade Runner one mm. does. And the reason is is that the in Blade Runner it is about whether or not Sean Young's character is human, and mm. that in that the character is essentially you know it's like Harrison Ford's character if this were 1850 is hunting down fugitive slaves and killing them, mm. and has just discovered that Sean Young is a fugitive slave who in the scene before he re- describes as an it. Yeah, and then he slams her up against the wall and forces himself on her. Yeah, like that is that it is the it is the content. It's not just that we have a male pushing mm-hmm. acquiescence on a female in a sexual manner, which yeah. is something we can have complicated feelings about. But it's the nature of the situation. It's that he does not think that she is human for most of the film. Right. You know. Well, the commonality of both those situations is the man thinks he knows better. Yeah, yeah. But but and the other thing, I mean, the other thing too is that and Terry, both women give in. Terry, Mal- yes, absolutely. Terry Malloy is a far more vulnerable person, sure, than uh, what's his name? Deckard. Deckard Rick is Deckard. Yeah, Blade Runner. Um, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> so my note here is problematic? Question mark? Question mark? Question <laughs> mark? There, I knew. So you. I knew we were going to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, right. Um, and then we hear. Hey, Terry, your brother's here. He wants to see you. We know. Yep. Terry goes down. Edie goes down the fire escape. Uh, she's calling, trying to find Terry. It's a scary scene. It is. We're in the dark. We're in an alleyway. We yeah. see some headlights. It's a truck coming right, barreling right down to take out uh, Edie. And Terry grabs her, 
breaks a window to get them out of the way. Yeah. Uh, Eva Marie Saint said that truck was way too close, and she was <laughs> genuinely scared. And and uh, Marlon Brando broke real glass in his hand. It really cut his hand. Wow. Yeah. And then <laughs> right after that, the truck goes by, and it's just so well shot. The mm-hmm. truck goes by, revealing Charlie hanging on a hook. Um, like a slab of meat. Yeah. Uh, and the score, by the way, is the same theme that Bernstein played during Father Barry's speech. Oh. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it's just, the music is amazing. It's good connected tissue. And, of course, Brando's reaction to seeing his dead brother is amazing and lifting him up off the hook. Yeah. It's, again, it's a very Christ-like yeah, moment. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. And he's lost it at this point. He tells her to stay with the body yeah. out in the open, which is really scary. Yeah. And he's going to go... Get his revenge. Confront Johnny. Yeah. And he heads off to Johnny Friendly's, which I always forget that he owns the bar. Yeah. Um, and he walks in. It's very dramatic. The music cuts out and no Johnny Friendly. And Terry's kind of taking control of the situation because, of course, he has his gun yeah. that his brother gave to him. <clears throat> and in comes Father Barry. I don't give me a hard time, Terry. What do you want? Your gun. Go and chase yourself. Give me the gun. You go to hell. Tell him the priest to go to hell. <laughs> no, you're supposed to turn the other cheek, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what Father That's Barry not does. Father Barry does, no. Uh, he punches him. Yeah. What did you say? Go to hell. Good punch, too. It was a good punch. Yeah. Shows you Terry's not as strong, is not as much of a fighter <laughs> as he used to be. Well, and he doesn't expect it from the priest. <laughs> Hell yeah, true. You want to hurt Johnny Friendly? Huh? You want to hurt him? You want to fix him? Do you? You really want to finish him? What do you think? For what he did to Charlie and a dozen other men who are better than Charlie? That's a great line. Yep. Dozen other people that are better than Charlie. Then don't fight him like a hoodlum down here in the jungle because that's just what he wants. He'll hit you in the head and plead self-defense. You fight him in the courtroom tomorrow with the truth. As you know the truth. Now you get rid of that gun. Unless you haven't got the guts, and then if you haven't, then you better hold on to it. Again, Cole Malden is just great. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then he says, give me a beer. <laughs> One of the things that I forgot to mention, when he's going up on that pallet, he, he gets another cigarette, like a yeah. bent cigarette that he smokes, and now he's getting a beer. Uh, and he gets Terry a beer. I love that. Um. And they keep, and Terry throws the gun into the picture, shattering the glass. Yeah, and we're in the courtroom. Yeah. Um, why do you think they didn't kill him? Why they didn't kill Terry? Yeah. Like, why didn't they all come after him? Maybe because the priest's there. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, maybe. Well, or I mean, follow I, him home, or wait for him, or kill yeah. him at home. Yeah. That's a good, because at this point they know he's yeah gonna, he's yeah. going to testify. But that's a great point. Apparently, some of the all the testimony that we're hearing as we go into the courtroom is directly from actual trial transcripts of actual oh. trials on the waterfront wow. against the mobs. And um, Johnny Friendly is there, and they call Terry Malloy, and Lee J. Cobb stands up. Uh, and there's great looks between them as he gets sworn in, and Terry's talking about everything. Mm-hmm. He's talking about Joey. Talking about murder, talking about Johnny Friendly, and we cut to, and this is just weird, a TV show, or TV, and the Mr. Big, who is really representing, who I forget his name, but the real uh, boss on the waterfront, is yeah. watching, and he says, if Mr. Friendly calls, I'm out. <laughs> and we're back to Terry, and they say thank you, and he's stepping off the uh, the stand, um, and people are saying it made it possible for honest men to work the docks without fear. And they call Lee J. Cobb to the stand, and as he goes by, Terry, oh. you just dug your own grave. You just dug your own grave. You just dug your own grave. Go for a minute. You're dead on this waterfront and every waterfront from Boston to New Orleans. You don't drive a truck or a cab. You don't push a bag of track. You don't work no place. Yeah, right. You're done. Just the, 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 he is he is a leashed tiger. Just raging at this thing next to him, yeah. Until he finally breaks, like he's working himself into a lather, and I think he has to, because Terry is such an imposing figure. Johnny has to work up his guts and his courage to come after him physically, 
And so I think this whole thing, this whole interaction with him is him like getting the guts to come after Terry. Yeah. Because Terry can knock him the fuck out. Sure. Although he does a lot better with Ter- against Terry at the end. Lee J. Cobb. Yeah, for a few seconds. For a few until seconds. Until he starts crying for his boys. Sure, that's true. Well, I mean, you know, you go up against a professional boxer who apparently could have been a contender, even if he is a f- few years out of shape. Yeah. That guy should wipe you out. Should. Um, the priest got a good shot at it. <laughs> it's a fair point. <laughs> Um, it's power of God. Um, all right, I've 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 held back on discussing what we now have to discuss. Okay, which is that we said in the first episode that Ilya Kazan joined the Communist Party in 1932. Yes, he was there for two years. Uh, they pressured him to control the group theater and his art. He didn't like it. They refused. They put him on trial. They found him guilty and they kicked him out of the Communist Party <laughs> in 1934. What do you mean put on trial? In 1952, he named names before HUAC, the House on American Activities Committee. Yep. This is, you know, the McCarthy era. This mm-hmm. is the blacklist. He did exactly what I would say the current perspective would say you shouldn't do. Right. Is he named other people uh, who had uh, been communists at that time. He says he didn't name anybody that the committee didn't already know. That's probably not true. That's right. been proven not to be true. Right. And he ruined many friendships and many of his relationships, including with Arthur Miller. And what he says, and he is uh, has a very uh, well-constructed argument about why he did what he did. Yeah. He says he lost faith in the Communist Party uh, when Stalin made the deal with Hitler. And he also felt that the ideals that he had kind of signed up for when he saw how manipulative the Communist Party was, how the American, he felt the American Communist Party was f- controlled by the Soviet Union to, you know, essentially take over the world, is that he saw them as evil and he felt that it was completely justified to turn against them and to be anti Soviet, uh, not necessarily anti some of the ideals that he still has about civil rights and about equality and right. about economics that he right. still believes in, but he hates, he came to hate the communist party. And that is why he did what he did in 1952. Mm. Now we're two years later. And there are many, many people th- that think that Terry Malloy in standing up to the mob in this film is Ilya Kazan's justification or rationalization for his actions in naming names during the blacklist. Sure. It's a difficult subject to, Look at because a I love Eli Kazan as a filmmaker. I love Me all too. His, I love pretty much all his movies, and I like the message he's saying here in this movie, standing up to corruption and this. But yeah, look at the context of when he named names. It was in the middle of the Red Scare. Joseph McCarthy was frothing at the mouth to catch all these communists. He played into the narrative, the dangerous narrative of. And look, I'm gonna risk getting some hate, but it's the same thing we're seeing now. Oh, this person. He's an anti-Trumper. This person never was on my side. This, these, everybody is is uh, against me except for the people who believe. And everybody is lying but me or the people who are with me. And it's that kind of thing. And so there are narratives created, right? And with the time that he was naming names, it was at the time when McCarthy was claiming that communists across the country were infiltrating media and infiltrating this and pushing the anti-American messages and pushing blah, blah, blah. And so it played into this ugly narrative that wasn't that wasn't happening. And so to me, there are two different things that are occurring between what happens in the movie versus what Kazan did. And when he got honored at the Oscars, you saw some people sat on their hands yep. as protest. Yep, wouldn't stand up. Yep, would not stand up. 50 years or 45 years after mm-hmm. this film, yep, because they still wouldn't stand up. Because they're union people, and they thought he... Screwed people. Well, and they're people that. that came. Hollywood people. The, well, and some of them were students of the people who yes. name, you know, because the Good you point. know the actor studio didn't want him around. Right. You know that you know that that he burned a lot of bridges. I, uh, so the first thing I will say about this yeah. is I don't think there's an answer here. That's fair. I, I don't think sure. so. So I think there's no question in my mind that the way the blacklist was handled and the and you know blacklisting actors because of certain political beliefs or because someone said that oh they happened to have were at this party with this person right. where this speech was made and now they're never going to work again is terrible mm-hmm. and and you know this is where the actual term a witch hunt 
comes from right. is the the method of having people name people to protect themselves without strong evidence you know because it comes from the Salem witch trials right. where there actually was nothing going on and the i and the idea too of having a because what was going on was anyone who had sort of a liberal bent in Hollywood yeah. and cared about things like civil rights and free speech and things like that, those were the kinds of people that were getting blacklisted. Mm -hmm. You know, plus a lot of people who were Jewish like me and there was, you know, the the it, that system yeah. which goes against freedom of speech and your your rights in this country to believe what you want to believe even if what you want to believe is unpopular yeah. is problematic to me mm -hmm. and so but i also think so i mean you know it's funny like there's the hollywood 10 and there's people like eddie dimitrick who's the one member of the hollywood 10 who did end up bowing to the pressure and naming names yep and eddie dimitrick happened to be my teacher at usc oh, wow. in his 90s wow. um, oh right you've told you spoke yeah. about him a few times um yeah. but but i understand if you are facing jail time or have had jail time that's tremendous pressure mm -hmm. and that if the end you buckle under it i'm not that judge I, I might go I might hope that I wouldn't do that, but I also go like, well, you know, that's just like saying I wouldn't uh, give in to torture or something. It's yeah, like, yeah, no, yeah. your whole life is under threat. And, and this is the <laughs> thing is that this is what Terry Malloy is in the middle of. Right. Is And I think, too, like the store I, I have. There's no question in my mind that Ilya Kazan's experiences with the Communist Party, his feelings about the Communist Party and his choice to name names is in this movie. Yeah. I think because that's part of him, just as uh, Bud Schulberg, who's the screenwriter, he also named names. Right. So there's no question that even if they weren't thinking of it consciously, that it's in here. Um, but I, I yeah, go ahead. But I also think like these ideas of loyalty versus whistleblower and uh, self interest versus group interest and all of these things that this movie is about, mm. man, this is resonant and important stuff, and it's not easy. Like there's a certain point at which you you should be loyal to your team, you right. know, at whatever level. Like let's say let's say I did something kind of shitty, mm -hmm. and then someone asked you about it. Now you're forced with, well, do I sell my friend Steve out and mm -hmm. say he did this shit? And I'm not talking about like a crime or anything. Right, right, right. I just acted like kind of an asshole. Do you sell me out or do you not? And now you have a choice of, well, how do I value my loyalty to my friend right. versus what is doing the right thing on some level? And as those things get bigger, yeah. you know, you look at like, um, uh, I want to say Peyton Manning, Chelsea Manning, mm -hmm. I forget his other name now, um, or you look at uh, Edward Snowden, yeah. these are whistleblowers. You know, or you look at the film The Insider. Yeah. You know, it's like these are someone who there's a certain point where you go and you could have you could hate Edward Snowden. You could think that he's a traitor who should be killed. Yeah. And uh, and there is a there is an argument of why he is because he had sworn this oath and he chose to violate that oath and yep. actually expose secrets that were important secrets out to the world. Yep. But he also but but there's no question in my mind that he did it because he thought it was the right thing. He right. didn't do it because he it was going to benefit him in any way. I mean, right. like he's had a very complicated life since then. Um, yeah. And 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 this is where again I'm trying to talk about this without talking about the politics. <laughs> but right now we're in a situation where there is a whistleblower, and there are very powerful people, very powerful forces that feel that this is a terrible person. Yeah. And there are very powerful forces who feel that this is a necessary person mm -hmm. to deal with corruption. And how we deal with that situation, again, this is why I go back to the first thing I said. This is complicated. Yeah. You know? Well, at the end of the day, they're communists, too. So, like, you know, you name names against right. communists. To me, I don't necessarily put that as a negative overall. I do understand the violation that you're playing into a narrative that is dangerous and costs people's lives and careers that's the negative about it but if you're going to name communists in our country i don't necessarily have an issue with that i think what happened was he did it at a time when there was a uh, uh an unhealthy approach to it that was maniacal from mccarthy and there were there wasn't um we weren't they weren't trying to get names so they could actually make some changes or hear discussions about this. They're trying to name names so they could destroy people for political advantage. It was disgusting, and that's what I think the context of the naming names issue is. Well, and th this is the thing. When I was in, when I was in high school, I had a... Because I would name Nazi names right now. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, well uh, here, here's the thing. So we're getting to like a really dangerous territory. So, so that's right. I, I, 
when I was in high school, I had a very brief flirtation with communism as, as a young person because I first read uh, read about Karl Marx. I hadn't mm. read those books yet. I later read uh, the Communist Manif- Manifesto and things like that. Yeah. But, uh, but the idea of, oh, people should share equally and each person to his ability and each right, person right, to right. his need and everyone's working together for a common goal. And then I went to Israel and I was on kibbutzes and kibbutzes are essentially communist situation everybody Mm -hmm. owns everything uh as a group everybody works together as a group and i was like wow this maybe this is how it should be and then very quickly by the time i was 17 i went no this is a terrible idea i don't like it but the idea that someone can flirt with an ideology like it's the middle of the depression yeah you see people starving you see other people that have gotten rich on people that are starving yeah you see uh you know massive amounts of racism and sexism things like this and the communist newspaper comes along and says hey this is wrong these people are abusing you. Right. You know, you read Clifford Odets is waiting for Lefty. Right. You look at the union movement. You look at the, the the burgeoning civil rights movement, and the only political organization talking about these things is the Communist Party. Right. And so, ninety, I think that I probably would have been one of those people <laughs> that was was interested in these ideas. Right. And then, but that it, and what happened in this country was we said anyone who believes in those things believes in Soviet dictatorship and hegemony. Right, right, right. You know, and that's not what those people believe. Exactly, and that's the point is like they the, to name names at that time when it was being painted that way was a mistake on Kazan's part in my opinion. Okay, and here's where I must say something that's terrible and dangerous. Oh boy. So, let's say you're a young man today. You're a young white man today. Sure. And you're disenfranchised and angry and you've unemployed and you've seen the alcoholism in your community and you have no connection to your parents and your family and your father's left town and you're angry and you're pissed off and someone comes along and says, "You know whose fault this is?" and they point across the way to people that look different. Yeah. And that 17-year-old young man goes, you're right. And that person tells you the things that you want to hear. Right. Well, the question is, so so can you come back from that? Mm-hmm. And I personally believe, believe you can. Of course. Even if those philosophies I find reprehensible. And so now you go, there's the guy who uh, got into Harvard who's conservative, and they found text messages between him and his friends where he had made racial jokes using the N-word, and he got yeah. kicked, kicked out of Harvard. Now, I don't think that somebody's shit that they said jokingly when they're 16 should mm-hmm. be held against them for the rest of their lives i believe people can learn and can grow and can change right even if they wanted to be a fucking nazi at 17 years old yeah now does that mean that i have sympathy for someone in the kkk putting up a burning cross on a black man's yard no right. i don't but do i believe that the that someone can come back from that yeah yeah i do you believe in the power of redemption i do very strongly. And I believe in the power of persuasion and I believe in the power of sensitivity and learning about other people. Most of the people, but partic- I don't know if you've listened to a lot of the people who like they were uh, a Nazi or something sure, like that. Sure. And then they came back and now they're fighting to bring other people right. out of that world, out of the white supremacist world. A lot of them, because I've heard several of these stories and I can't tell you how often these stories involve Jewish people. Yeah. Because they meet the rabbi and the rap like there's one guy and I forget his name but he's this is his main work is he had been a white supremacist he had been in one of these neo-nazi groups and his right. main work is get, getting people out and what he says is a rabbi sat down with him for three straight days and talked hmm. and listened to him and shared things with him and at the end he went oh my god how can I hate this person right. this person has shown me more compassion than anyone I've ever met and that changed his life yeah and so that to me like that's the hope and if you can just condemn the pe- people out of hand, then we don't have that hope. Yeah. All right. It's a big digression. It's it's, it's fun. Yeah. He's we're out of the, we're out of the trial. He's yeah. back in his apartment. Yeah. He's got cops with him now. Um, they're there to protect him theoretically, but this isn't. Now he's lost all his friends. No one's standing by him. He's surrounded by cops. He's essentially lost his whole life. Right. Uh, he sees Edie. You know, she wants to embrace him, and he's like, "My friends won't even talk to me." Yeah. And he walks out. And he goes out the window, heads up on the roof, and there's that kid on the roof. And he says, hey, champ. And the kid runs away. Terry follows him, and he throws something at him. Yep. And we realize it's a dead pigeon. Yeah, man. A pigeon for a pigeon. And he's crying. Yeah. Because he doesn't want to do it. Yeah. And he runs away, and uh, Terry heads over to the pigeon coop, and all the pigeons are dead. Yeah, And Terry, once again... Terry has that face he had with Charlie. Like, yeah. Ah, he's not even mad. His reaction is not to get angry. No. This is the thing about Terry. The only time he gets angry is when he sees Charlie dead. That's the only time he really gets angry. It, 
the two times where people betray him, which is Charlie and then here with the kid, where they commit something to to, to either threaten to hurt him or hurt intentionally hurt him, he feels sympathy for them. He feels sad that they resorted to doing something like this. He knows it's a kid, you know. I think you pointing out the relationship between his reaction to Charlie pulling the gun and the pigeons, that is brilliant. You're 100% right. I hadn't thought about it. Mm. That is so, you're so on the money. It's just sad. Yeah. And it's kind of that, oh, wow. Yeah. Like that, to, to hurt all these innocent birds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. The innocent birds. Yeah. To kill them. Yeah. To snap their necks. They did nothing. Yeah. You know? Um, and then Edie comes and she's like, well, you can't be here. Maybe you go live on a farm right. or something like that, you know? And, and, and she does, he doesn't, under, she doesn't understand what he's trying to say. She's not even listening to him. Yeah. And he looks up and he grabs that hook off the door. You're going down there. That's because John Fanley warned you not to. You're going down there. You think you got to prove something to them that you're not afraid of them or something. Well, go ahead. Get it over with. Go down the shape of and get yourself killed. You stupid pig-headed. What are you trying to prove? I think Edie is saying the same things to Terry that she said to Joey. Oh, you think so? I see because I thought Edie was away. Do you think you think that she said? Mm-hmm. I think either she, if she was away with the sisters, I'm sure they communicated maybe over letters. And maybe Joey said to her, I'm going to do this. And maybe she wrote to him, don't do this. This is stupid. Why are you going to blah, 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 blah. But no, I got to do this. See, I don't know if I agree because mm-hmm. what's Edie all about from the moment we see her? She's about standing up. Yeah. And Joey was standing up. So why up. does she not want him to stand up now? Well, because there's nothing to stand up for. Oh. Like he, she, he already did the thing that was what she wanted, which was to testify. Right. What's the point of going down there? Well, that's the thing. I, I think he has to go down there. Because I think that's how the film's structured. What? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, the confrontation has to happen to make yeah. real change. It isn't just testifying. It's just, it's going down there and destroying the empire. Yeah. In a symbolic way. In a symbolic, yes. In absolutely. a symbolic way. They always said I was a bum. Well, I ain't a bum, Edie. Don't worry, I'm not going to hurt nobody. I'm just going to go down there and get my rights. So we're at the docks. He walks up, the crowd separates. The foreman blows his whistle. Terry's right out there in front. People come up behind. All right, everybody works today. And everyone's kind of looking at Terry. Everyone works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And starts calling out names. And we cut into Johnny's shack yeah. down on the waterfront. And the newspaper says that Johnny's getting indicted. And it basically, he's like, we got to lay low. That's the real thing. We just, like, just got to get past this. And now we're back up on the docks, and everyone has been called except Terry, who's standing there. Right. And they go over and call the drunk that we saw from that scene with Edie way back in part one of our podcast. Yeah, at some short guy, and they call him in. The short, I love the short guy going. I'm good. I'm good. I'm gonna <laughs> stay out here warming my hands. Um, <laughs> and then they say to Terry, "Come back tomorrow." And everyone looks. Yeah. Pops there, and Terry looks down at Johnny's shack, and in the shack. Uh, Johnny's going, we got to get rid of these guns. You know, we don't want any of these around. Um, and he locks all the guns in the safe. <laughs> and because he says, When you get it through your heads, they're dusting off the hot seat for me. So he's genuinely scared. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Terry is looking at the shack and he starts walking, and all the other workers follow. It's a great moment. Dusting off the hot seat is the electric chair, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's an electric chair. Hey, friendly! John Friendly, come out of there! Friendly! He throws something at the door. You want another trouble with you? You think it makes you a big man if you give the answers? Well, at the right time, I'll catch up with you. Be thinking about that. Now go on, beat it. Don't push your luck. Wait a minute, you! You take them heaters away from you and you're nothing, you know that? You talk yourself in the river. You take the good goods away and the kickbacks and a shakedown cabbage and a pistol arrows and you're nothing! I think Terry has figured out something profound about life, which is underneath, you take away all the stuff, we're all the same. Yeah. And he thought Johnny was better than him. He thought he was a superior person. Yeah. But now he's just realized, like, oh, without this money, without all this power, without all this stuff, you're nothing. Yeah. 
I love the defiance in yeah. Brando during this whole yeah. scene. Because because Johnny says, you ratted on us. And he says, from where you stand, maybe, but I'm standing over here now. I was ratting on myself all them years. I didn't even know it. I love that line. It's great. You think you're God Almighty, but you know what you are? Am I? You're a cheap, lousy, dirty, stinking mug. And I'm glad what I've done to you. You hear that? I'm glad what I've done. And I'm going to keep on doing it till I get Come on! Today. Come on! And then they fight. Yeah. Come um, on! Yeah. And and Lee J. Cobb at the beginning kind of has an advantage. And then, does. then Terry comes back. Terry starts kicking the shit out of yeah. him. And he screams like a little bitch for his boys to come out. And they all come in and yeah. it's just, and someone says, it's a massacre. Yeah. And then the guys go, what are we waiting for? And yeah. they go to go help. And Johnny calls them off. Yeah. Eventually. And Carl Malden shows up and Edie shows up. And they come up to those thugs that are sort of barricading them from getting to Terry. Yeah. And one of the thugs pushes Edie. Pushes Edie. Yeah. Ooh, dangerous. Yeah. And Johnny finally says, you want him? You can have him. <laughs> And they go down to Terry, cut to Terry lying on that pier in the water. Yeah, face down. Just be, clearly he's had mm -hmm. the shit beaten out of him. Mm -hmm. And now what happens is the guy who obviously owns the ship that needs unloading or whatever it is, kind of goes, who's in charge here? Because he needs people working on doing yeah. the job. Yeah. And Johnny comes out and says, I'm in charge. And he's like, well, you got to get the people to work. And, and Johnny Friendly's trying to get people to work. And they start to go. How about Terry? He don't work, we don't work. Work! He can't even walk! <laughs> I think Lee J. Cobb has the most interesting line delivery. Oh, yeah. And he's trying to reestablish his power. Of course. I, 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 I say who works and he doesn't work. Right. And Pop, Evie's dad, says, All my life you push me around. Oh, come on! And what happens to Johnny Friendly? He goes into the river. He goes into the drink. Ah! Okay, and everyone starts laughing, and, and people start calling to Terry, and then they see him, and, and they all say, Terry works, or we don't. Did you hear that, Terry? Terry. Terry, did you hear that? Yeah. You lost the battle, but you have a chance to win the war. What I have to do walk. Father. Can you walk? Brando does such incredible work here. It's so believable that he's like, kind of out of it and physically in pain and when he stands up and falls back and he says i don't think i can do it yeah. like that's yeah. we've been sold a bill of goods of terry malloy this whole movie that he's this like you know indomitable force this like push it just keeps coming at you in a different way he's stubborn he wants to understand blah 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 and here in this moment we get the possibility that he might not be able to do it. I thought it was brilliant. Just brilliant. Well, and I love that 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 he needs Father Barry to tell him yeah. the right thing. It's the tough love. Which which he's Father Barry says, Johnny Friendly's taking odds that you can't get up. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I think about that. It's as, cheap, but it works. Oh yeah. Well, I mean it's Johnny Friendly that made Terry take the dive. Yeah. You know? And so now he oh, literally yeah, good is, point. he is he is rewriting that bit of history. He is standing up after a way worse beating than from Wilson. Yeah. And he is showing that he he will not take a dive. He will get up no matter what the cost. And he says, get me on my feet. And they and they get him on his feet. And I love that he says, they ask, how are you doing? And he says, am I on my feet? Am I on my feet? Yeah. That's great. He's so out of it. Uh, Kazan saw this walk as the stages of the cross. Well, of course. Yeah. Duh. Yeah, logically. Yeah. Uh, and he starts to fall. And they say, finish what you started. Yeah. Um, and, and and the guys say, if if Terry works, Johnny is broken on this dock forever. We take back our union. I think this is totally ridiculous in terms of anything real. But I don't care. It doesn't matter. Of course. Because this is a symbolic scene. Yes. This is a symbolic moment. It doesn't make sense logically. But it doesn't matter. Terry making this walk is just going to destroy Johnny Friendly. We won't see its like again, ironically, until Rocky IV. When Stallone wins over the Soviet Union crowd. <laughs> I didn't know. Okay, so I didn't know where you're going. 
I think that is an awesome comparison. <laughs> it's Soviets, uh, Ely Kazan, communism. It's all mixed in here, man. It, 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 it's, it's funny you say that because, you know, I, I put out the, the clues sometimes. I don't always remember oh, yeah, to yeah. do it. And this clue in particular this time was I wanted everyone to think it was Rocky because right. I wrote something like, you know, uh, uh, a, a down on his luck fighter, uh, uh, an unlikely romance and the fight he know he can't win but has to do or something. I don't yeah, remember right. what it was exactly. And I, I genuinely was just like, this sounds exactly like Rocky, <laughs> yeah. but it's really on the waterfront. But the more I thought about it, it's like, I don't think there's Rocky without on the waterfront. No, that's a very there, good point. There is so much of Rocky in this movie, yep. except that Rocky is only personal stakes. It's not dealing with bigger issues. Of course, not until Rocky Four. <laughs> well, that's why it's so <laughs> great that you brought that up. Uh, the walk is amazing. Yeah, it really is. And as it goes along, all realistic sound drops out. There's no backgrounds. There's no foley. There's no effects. There's nothing. Yeah. It's just that Leonard Bernstein score. The stumbling. The stumbling, the long yeah. lens work, the POV, the blurry handheld. The, yeah. I mean, his eyes almost rolling up in his head. The blinking is so clear. And then, and then when he makes it to the guy with the suit and the pride, mm -hmm. when he just stands up and goes, all right, I'm ready to work. I just, and, and Johnny there seeing it um trying to stop the men from doing it and the guy yells all right let's go to work and they all go off to work into that warehouse or whatever and the big door slides down and that is the end of on the waterfront yeah a powerful, yeah, powerful ending of a movie, and I love the God's eye view. Yeah, if you're going to show a Christ walk, the mm. end, you have to show the God's eye view. In my opinion, absolutely, that makes perfect sense. I hadn't thought about it, but it makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's obviously a very big hit. Earns 4.2 million dollars at the box office, which is a lot of money at that time. At the time, yeah. um, ten Oscar nominations, one of the largest in history. It won for best picture, best director, actor for Brando, screenplay, supporting actors for Eva Marie Saint. Art direction, cinematography, and editing. The most interesting thing to me is that it's nominated for three Best Supporting Actors. Right. Three. Carl Malden. Lee J. Cobb. Lee J. Cobb. And Rod Steiger. Rod Steiger. So, and, and, and of course, they don't win. And to me, it's like, <laughs> of course they don't win because they stole each other's votes. Exactly. Split the votes. Yeah. And so it's actually... Um, uh, Eddie O'Brien wins for the Barefoot Contessa, <laughs> which I've never seen. Nor will we ever. I mean, maybe he's great. But I think, you know, I, yeah. mean, I mean, how do you pick between those three guys? I think you go Cobb, in my opinion. And I go, oh, wait. And no, I go I think, Malden. Uh, yeah, fair, fair, fair. I think you go Malden. But I think Steiger's great. He I mean, is. He's so good. But I think Malden has more of a nuanced performance throughout the show, the different levels yeah. of that character. Um, There's an arc to, to yeah. him. As I said at the very beginning of our first podcast, I don't think we have a 70s without, without On the Waterfront. Sure. Certainly Martin Scorsese is so hugely influenced by this film yep. and the idea of looking at the real world, the idea of the grit, of the dealing with the real human pain, of shooting on real locations, of the way it's filmed, all that mm. stuff, the style of acting, obviously, we talked about method acting, it's a huge, huge influence. I wish he'd direct a film like this. He doesn't, right? He directs gangster pic pictures, which are great, and they certainly explore a lot of fun things and also a lot of real things. But he's never directed something like On the Waterfront, right? Taxi Driver doesn't do this. Raging Bull doesn't do this necessarily. It depends on what you mean by this. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's certainly in terms of Mean Streets or Taxi Driver, yeah, King, yeah, like yeah. dealing with these kind of people who are real people on the street with sure. complicated histories in a very sort of realistic but poetic and violent way. Mm. I think he does. Sure. But in terms of dealing with an issue like That's on what the I mean. waterfront, no, That's what I mean. He doesn't. A real, a realistically political issue and, have, and, and picking a side. That's an interesting statement I had never thought about until this moment is that has Martin Scorsese ever done anything that's political? No. And not until the last few weeks when he's been coming in against those Marvel movies and superhero movies. Did you read his New York Times article? Yeah, I did. I read it this morning. I liked it a lot. I to I, I thought so too. Yeah. I liked it a lot, but I don't 100% agree with him, but I I liked it a lot. I thought I think he defended his beliefs very well. I also think it's a little bit like, well, it was, uh, you know, uh, slavery was a thing at the time. We were all okay with it. Well, what about abolitionists? Because they certainly existed at the same time you did and didn't like slavery. Sure. It's the same thing. You can't say me and my people grew up with this kind of movies when George Lucas is a contemporary of yours making Star Wars. Or Steven Spielberg, 
who's right. making Jaws or Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You can't say uh, that. I, I think there's a, a hypocrisy there, but I also yes. think it's a respectful article Should that says... Be. Totally. And, and, you know, he reflects something we, I've said on the Cinephiles a lot, which is, I mean, so personally, I like the I like the Marvel movies. Yeah. I like those kinds of movies. But they uh, that corporate, top-down uh, approach to filmmaking has uh, silenced so many other kinds of filmmaking, you know... I don't know, man. I don't know if I 100% agree with you. I really don't because I don't think the Marvel movies can, as much as people want to shove them into that idea of corporate down from that kind of thing, these movies are artistically fantastic films with incredible good actors I in totally, them. I agree. I totally yeah, agree. And they really deal with human stakes. Uh, regardless, regardless of what Scorsese says in the article, there are real stakes. People cried at the end of Infinity War when they saw who was dying. I, and it was I, I like, did. Whoa. I, well, this or is, at the so, end of Endgame. I, I, what I what I dislike, and maybe we should have done this as a Patreon short, sure, sure, but, sure. But, but we're not. Not 11.39, we we're not. No. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I dislike statements like, it's not cinema. I right. think Scorsese has a thing in his head. Yes. And that, to me, is like this linguistic thing where it's mm-hmm. like, okay, you have a thing in your head of what cinema is. Right. I, I was at a play once in college where the play... Uh, uh, had video cameras and there were video monitors next to the stage yeah. and I had my sort of good actor like professional actor friend who came to see me in this play right. and said I mean it's okay but it's not a play <laughs> and I was like that's a stupid statement it was a play I right. was there right. it was a play Marvel movie you know I don't know what Scorsese thinks is or is not cinema right. but I, but the fact the point that he's making is like that this takes up a lot of the oxygen in movie making, and people. I mean, he made the Irishman, and we had just talked about the Joker, right. which strangely enough is way more of a Scorsese movie than a superhero and movie, and ironically political and political. Whereas Scorsese has um, yet to do that. Like I, I, I do think that there aren't as many on the waterfront taxi drivers, and you know those kinds of films aren't mm-hmm. being made by the studios. You know, yes, that's a fair point, Steve. I think you know? that's actually a very fair point. Um, anyway, we've digressed. <laughs> Uh, one thing I had in my notes is that in 1982, uh, Ilya Kazan uh, was given the Kennedy Center Award, uh, the honor, and it was presented by him to him by Ronald Reagan. Wow. Which I just find sort of interesting that the communist name-namer uh, who made a union uh, movie about the mob and all this stuff was presented the... Uh, award by the strongest anti-communist mm-hmm. who was the only by the way still the only union president to be elected president true because he was the president of sag and was the president of sag at the time of i don't know if he was in 52 but definitely during the blacklist period yeah ronald reagan was the president and so like all of that stuff is just sort of strange <laughs> and as you mentioned he when he won the honorary oscar in uh 99 a whole bunch of people didn't stand up yeah so john yeah do you have final thoughts on On the Waterfront? Well, I'll say this. I'm really surprised I didn't cry once during this, our conversation about the film. And I, and I apologize. I have the tissues. <laughs> yeah, that you have the tissues. I said I would bring tissues. Yeah, you did. Uh, but, I think it's be- but I think because the film excites me still, man. What, 1954, like you said, Steve, This it, it's what, six decades old? Six, 65 years old is incredible and still resonates with people, still resonates with our world and our country. And whatever country you live in, the idea of corruption within an organization or corruption by the head down, uh, trying to keep those less fortunate in a certain position so they never rise up, uh, so you can keep making your money and feeling your power. Uh, and I think the film speaks to so many situations that go on in our world throughout, throughout our lives. And I love that. I think the acting is stellar. It's top notch. It doesn't feel cheesy. It doesn't feel cheap. It doesn't feel unearned now in retrospect. Uh, I think it's incredibly well directed from from Eli Kazan. Eva Marie Saint is absolutely uh, like radiant throughout the whole movie, yet still a very real character on her own emotional journey. You, you mentioned Carl Malden. I mean, what can you say about them that we haven't already covered through the whole these two uh, parts of this uh, podcast? But like Carl Malden shows out in this movie in a way that he doesn't get a chance to show out before, and Lee J. Cobb is goddamn perfect as Johnny Friendly and so to me overall it's not just about Brando's performance which is still my favorite performance by the way from anything he's ever done it's more about what the overall film represents still and why it's one of the classic films that should never be lost to time and I think it's it teaches lessons still 
even now when I watched it again at my age, I still got something new out of it. And that's what makes the film uh, transcendent to me and timeless. Agreed. You know, we live in the, a world where there's so much media that it actually, you know, when we grew up, you could watch almost everything there was to watch. Yep. Like if you had had a VCR in 1975, you could watch everything. Yep. And today you can't. We're surrounded by media. A lot of it is really good. And you sort of like, the question comes up of like, well, why should we return to these old movies? What is the point of going back and studying, not just watching, but studying a great film from the past? Yeah. And to me, On the Waterfront is a perfect example of one of those movies that as you step into it, that the world opens up is so deep and so complicated and it has so much to teach and so much to make you think about. So on, on the one hand, it's just the film. It's just the performance of Brando. It's the story of a real thing, corruption, that was going on on the docks and the moving, powerful story of one man slowly standing up and the cost of that and the pain of that and the courage of that and the power of that and that's great and then you also can look at it and think about like well this this represents this change in acting that we talked about in terms of the rise of the method and you could watch these method actors malden and eva marie saint and lee j cobb and steiger and of course brando and as you say at least in the top three of his great performances, yeah. you know, there's, I don't think anyone could argue anything else. And, and, and so that's amazing to watch. And then when you take another step back and you look at Ilya Kazan and his history and who he is, and then that leads you to the idea of the communist party and the blacklist and the whistleblowers and what that means and how we feel about that. And all of that, we take all of that and then we can apply it to today because as we said, and I think you and I, we're very restrained in yes. a lot of ways and not going into the fact that we are dealing with these issues of loyalty and corruption and whistleblowers and whose side are you on and are you going to stick with your side or are you not right now today? And that is the power of great films, that great yeah. films continue to be relevant. They continue to have something to teach every time you go and look at them. And there's no question in my mind that On the Waterfront holds its place of one of the great films of all time. So that's what we think of On the Waterfront. We'd love to hear what you think. You can visit us on our Facebook page, do a search for The Cinephiles. You could subscribe to the show and at all those places, please leave your comments, leave your reviews. You can uh, support the show by going to patreon.com slash the cinephiles. You can buy or stream On the Waterfront on cinephiles.net mm -hmm. along with every other movie we've ever reviewed. And if you want to reach me, you can do so on Twitter at SR Morris, on Instagram at SR Morris One. John, where can they reach you? You can always reach me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. And please, Patronize the Collider stuff. Patronize the Geek Buddies. Patronize the Top Ten. There's all great stuff that I do. But don't patronize them. Oh, that don't is, that would be rude. Them. But patronize, patronize them, them, definitely. And, and for those of you who are supporting our shows, thank you so much. And, you know, we are going to make some changes, I think, coming up soon with our patron, thanks to uh, 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 some with some assistance here. And uh, hopefully it'll encourage more of you to become patrons of the show uh, as we meet more and more of your needs uh, because we love how much you, you champion this show. Yeah, and I think that's it for this week. We will be back next week with another great film on The Cinephiles. Mm -hmm.